Hello and welcome. Moss Adams is pleased that you joined us for today's session, Governmental Accounting Standards Board Update. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today. We'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. All right, and now I would like to introduce today's presenters, Amanda McCleary-Moore and Ashley Austin, both partners here at Moss Adams. Their bios and contact information are located in your webcast console if you would like more information. And now I would like to turn the floor over to Ashley to get the presentation started. Thank you so much and good morning, everyone. So first we'll go over our learning objectives for this morning's session. The first is just to identify the major revisions of recent GASB pronouncements. We'll also describe GASB's recent statements and their impact on governmental entities. And then finally, we'll go ahead and identify timeline and steps to take to prepare for the implementation of those standards. So the first standard that we're gonna walk through today is GASB Statement 87, which was issued back in June of 2017. Of course, there's quite a bit of guidance that's uh, out there related to GASB 87. Of course, the standard on the far left-hand side of your slide, then the GASB issued Implementation Guide 2019-3, and then Implementation Guide Update 2020. And then, of course, the standard was delayed uh, by GASB 95, the postponement of the effective dates of certain authoritative guidance, and is now coming down the road and is effective for June 30, 2022 year ends and forward. Amy, it looks like we have our first poll. All right, so our first polling question is, when does your organization plan to implement GASB 87? A, during the original effective date in the standard for reporting periods beginning after December 15, 2019, uh, B, not until after the postponement under GASB 95 for reporting periods beginning after June 15, 2021, or C, already implemented. And we will give you a few moments to respond. Uh, to respond, please click the answer next, uh, the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit. And if you can't see the submit button, you will need to enlarge your slide area.
And it looks like most have responded. So I'm going to pull up the answers here. Okay, thank you so much, Amy. So it looks like a few did already implement. So I'll probably ask you to tone out, uh, tune out the, the next few slides here. We're going to go through a few just kind of basic slides about the standard, um, which will be applicable to some of you that haven't already implemented the standard. Okay, so first, what is a lease? Uh, GASB 87 defines a lease as a contract that conveys control of the right to use another entity's non-financial asset. The underlying asset is specified in the contract for a period of time in an exchange or exchange-like transaction. So as noted on the slide, that will require four different elements to be present. The first is a contract, so something that is legally enforceable, whether that's written or verbal. Also, control of the right, which we'll walk through a little bit more on the next slide. It has to be longer than 12 months. And then both parties give and receive equal value. So some governmental contracts that transfer the right to use an asset require, say, only a nominal amount, such as $1 per year, to be exchanged for the right to use a specific asset. This would this wouldn't be considered an exchange-like transaction, so lessors and lessees have to give and receive equal value in order to be in accordance with the standard. So to, to determine whether a contract conveys control of the right to use the underlying asset a government should really assess whether it has both of the following items on this slide. So first, the right to obtain the present service capacity from use of the underlying asset is specified in the contract and also the right to determine the nature and manner of use of the underlying asset as specified in the contract. The reason the board decided to put emphasis on the notion of control is, is really to differentiate the right to use the asset of a different legal entity rather than control of the underlying asset itself, which is ultimately retained by the lessor, so owning the asset, for example. The other reason the board added this notion of control focuses on differentiating leases from other types of contracts, things like supply contracts, which are scoped out of the standard. A supply contract would be something like a power purchase agreement, which provides access to the output of the asset rather than the control of the right to use the asset. So there are several items that were scoped out of the standard, which are listed on this slide. The standard doesn't apply to leases of intangible assets, things such as rights to explore for or to exploit natural resources like gas, oil, minerals, similar non-regenerative resources, um, licensing contracts for items such as copyrights and then also computer software. Also scoped out of the standard include biological assets, inventory, service concession arrangements accounted for on and also arrangements associated with conduit debt, and finally, supply contracts, which I mentioned on the previous slide, things like power purchase agreements. So where do you start looking for leases? Hopefully, everyone has at least started this process already, but if you haven't, we've accumulated a few areas where it may be a good place to start looking for those leases. First, you know, collecting all of those executed agreements and amendments in effect when you're either using someone else's asset or someone else is using your asset. You may also consider reviewing your work papers that were prepared um, in prior years for capital and operating lease financial statement disclosures, keeping in mind that you may have only disclosed material leases for financial statement reporting purposes. Finally, consider reviewing your accounting ledger to um, assist in capturing where lease and rental payments are accumulated if you're a lessee, or where lease and rental receipts are accumulated if you're a lessor. As you review those various areas to accumulate that complete population of leases, it's also a good idea to thoroughly document that process that you go through, as your auditors will be very interested in verifying the completeness of the population in addition to the various tests we will have to perform to analyze the leases that are recorded in accordance with the standard. So once you have a complete population of those leases, this slide helps to walk through how to format the lease data. So best practice would be to save those lease documents as searchable PDF files and then use the bookmark feature that uh, would help you identify and track those key lease provisions, things like lease term, interest rate if it's included, other key items. 
Another best practice to adopt would be to require that all those lease documents that are accumulated be scanned and indexed in one central repository. For those of you on the call that are part of a larger governmental entity, maybe this, this may require a new process be put into place to really ensure that all those contracts that are executed in the procurement department make their way to accounting for them to be evaluated to determine if, they're, if they should be accounted for in accordance with Statement 87 or not. Once there are processes implemented and all those leases are saved in one general location, it's also best practice to ensure there's appropriate user access to any modules that are set up for tracking leases. This may also be a single spreadsheet, but it's important to validate who can access and update it, whether it's a module or a separate spreadsheet. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that that user access should be reviewed at least annually, just to ensure that access remains appropriate. So once you have a complete population of leases, it's time to really dive in and review and document those key lease provisions, including all of those items that are listed on this slide, lease counterparty, asset under contract, fiscal funding clause, renewal provisions, if there are options to extend and what those options are, commencement and termination dates, and then the stated or implicit rate of interest. All of these items will certainly play into the amounts that are ultimately recorded in accordance with Statement 87. A couple other considerations. So establishing segregation of duties around the preparation and approval of those lease determinations, the calculations, the journal entries, that's just as important as setting up appropriate user access for the various modules that are uh, maybe used to track those entries in your accounting system. There are certain softwares available that uh, can be utilized to automatically generate the amortization schedules and create journal entries. And to the extent that that's available to your organization, those should be considered as they can potentially simplify the accumulation of information for financial reporting purposes. The final consideration on this slide is, is really to identify any potential changes in the types of revenue, operating versus non-operating, for example, and how that might impact any financial covenants that the organization must comply with. Now would be a really good time to discuss those impacts with your financial institution if you have the impacts calculated. A couple other best practices here. So I've tried to kind of mention a few of those along the way this morning, but this really summarizes all of them on one slide. Ultimately, uh, completeness is the most difficult assertion that we are going to audit as auditors when it comes to GAS 87. So documenting when the accounting or finance team learns about a new lease or lease term revision is important to ensure that each lease is accounted for appropriately in accordance with, that, with the standard. It's also important to establish who can negotiate terms on behalf of the entity and how those are ultimately communicated to the accounting department. It may be necessary to establish new policies or amendments to existing policies in relation to the accounting for leases. Of course, segregation of duties will be a key best practice item to consider. And then monitoring who is reviewing those entries to record the asset and the liability or the receivable and the deferred inflow of resources. Who's reviewing those amortization schedules as you're preparing your financial statements for financial reporting purposes. And then those IT risks associated with automatic journal entries, those automated controls, who's reviewing those and is there appropriate segregation of duties there as well all good things to consider. So at the very end of the standard, and as it turns out, um, pretty much every standard it, that the GASB issues, it states that the provisions of this statement need not be applied to immaterial items. So what does that actually mean? Um, materiality is subject to, of course, professional judgment, and management's assessment of materiality may be different than the materiality that's set by auditors. So as you review the leases that Statement 87 is applicable to, you may consider it appropriate to establish a policy similar to things like a capitalization policy for capital assets really to operationalize that materiality level. Alternatively, as you review the makeup of your organization's leases and identify a grouping of leases that may be immaterial, things like if your organization had a handful of copiers, um, it may also be appropriate to consider the impact of recording those leases um, if they're immaterial. When making those determinations, highly recommend, of course, that you consult with your auditor to ensure that they're in agreement with those assessments, because as I've mentioned, management's materiality threshold can differ from the auditor's materiality threshold. 
Also included on this slide, we reference question 4.23 in the Implementation Guide 2019-3, which that address addresses whether the same capitalization threshold can be applied to lease liabilities. And the GASB indicated that lease liabilities that are significant, either individually or in the aggregate, should be recognized. So when applying a capitalization threshold to leases, lessees should consider the quantitative and qualitative significance of the lease liability in addition to the significance of the lease asset. We have some bonus content here, GASB statement number 96. Uh, we're, we're just including a few short slides on, on statement 96, which is subscription-based IT arrangements. While Statement 96 isn't effective until years ending June 30, 2023, because it aligns so closely with Statement 87, many are recommending that GASB 96 be adopted in concert with 87. So under Statement 96, the government generally should recognize a right to use subscription asset, an intangible asset, and a corresponding subscription liability. And a government should recognize the subscription liability at the, at the beginning of the subscription which is when that asset is placed into service. The subscription liability would be initially the value of subscription payments expected to be made during that period. And measurement of the subscription asset includes certain capitalizable implementation costs based on the stages listed on this slide, which I do plan to go through um, in a little bit more detail in the next couple of slides. Just a little bit more about how that subscription asset is initially measured. It's initially measured at the sum of the initial subscription liability amount. Um, any payments made to the speed of vendor for the beginning of the subscription term, and then three capitalizable implementation costs, um, minus any incentives received from the speed of vendor at or before the beginning of that subscription term. A government would then recognize amortization of the subscription asset as an outflow of resources over that term. So now that I've told you how a SPEDA should be recorded, what is it exactly? So a SPEDA is defined as a contract that conveys control of the right to use another party's information technology software alone or in combination with tangible capital assets as specified in the contract for a period of time and exchange or exchange-like transactions. That sounds a lot like a lease uh, definition in accordance with 87. So GASB Statement 96 does exclude contracts that are a combination of IT software and tangible capital assets that meet the definition of 87, but the software component is insignificant when compared to the total cost of the underlying capital asset. The statement also doesn't apply to governments that provide the right to use their IT software and associated tangible capital assets, their entities through SPEDAs. Contracts that meet the definition of a public-private or public-public partnership or licensing arrangements that provide a perpetual license to governments to use a vendor's computer soft software, which are subject to Statement 51. So activities associated with the SPEDA are grouped into three separate stages as listed on this slide. So in the preliminary project stage, that includes the conceptual kind of formulation and evaluation of alternatives that determination of existence of needed technology, and then the final selection of alternatives for the SPEDA. And then as noted on this slide, outlays during this phase would be expensed as incurred. Activities in the initial implementation stage, those include you know, ancillary charges related to designing that chosen path, things like configuration, coding, testing, installation associated with the government's access to the underlying IT assets. Other ancillary charges that are required to place the subscription asset into service would also be included in this stage. The initial implementation stage for the SPEDA is completed when that subscription asset is, is finally placed into service and you're gonna start amortizing it. So generally during this stage, outlays are capitalized, but if there's no subscription asset recognized, for example, if the SPEDA is a short term, 12 months, then outlays would be expensed as incurred. And then finally, the operation and additional implementation stage. That stage includes things like maintenance, troubleshooting, other activities associated with kind of the government's ongoing access to underlying IT assets. Activities during this stage may include additional implementation activities that occur after the asset is placed into service. And generally during this stage, outlays would be expensed as incurred. 
But if, for example, there was an additional module that was implemented at a different time, then those outlays would be capitalized for those costs incurred. Oftentimes when an organization is implementing a new system, data conversion has to occur. So the standard specifically calls out data conversion and notes that it should be considered an activity of the initial implementation stage only to the extent that it is determined to be necessary to place that asset into service. So it would be able to be capitalized in that initial implementation stage. Otherwise, those data conversion costs should be considered an activity of the operation and additional implementation stage and expense costs as incurred. So the standard is effective for all fiscal years beginning after June 15, 2022 or June 30, 2023 year ends and forward. Although, as I mentioned before, earlier application is encouraged, especially in consideration of Statement 87 and how they align so well together. Assets and liabilities resulting from SPEDA should be recognized and measured using the facts and circumstances existed at the beginning of the fiscal year in which the statement is implemented. So if it's applied to any earlier fiscal years, those assets and liabilities should be recognized and measured using the facts and circumstances that existed at the beginning of the earliest fiscal year that's restated. Governments are permitted but are not required to include in the measurement of that asset capitalizable outlays associated with the initial implementation stage and the operation and additional implementation stages incurred that's prior to the implementation of, of this statement. Amy, it looks like we have another polling question. So back to you. All right, thank you. So our second polling question does your organization plan to adopt GASB Statement Number 96 in conjunction with GASB Statement Number 87? A, of course, B, absolutely not, or C, or C, still considering. And then as a reminder, if you would like to receive CPE uh, for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. We'll leave this up another five seconds. All right, here are the results. Okay, thanks, Amy. Looks like some of you are definitely planning on adopting 96 in conjunction with statement 87. You get a gold star for me. Um, absolutely not, totally understand 87 is a huge standard and it's widely applicable to really all organizations, but hopefully uh, the last few slides had you still considering and it looks like quite a, quite a few of you are still considering. So we're just gonna mention a little bit about statement 89. We have one lonely slide on this standard which may have been early adopted by many of you on this call today, but to the extent it hasn't been adopted, organization yet we did want to include some highlights as it's effective for those December 31st 2021 year ends and forward. The overall objective of the standard was really to enhance that relevance and comparability of information about capital assets and the cost of borrowing for a reporting period as well as simplify the accounting for interest costs incurred before the end of a construction period and I really do think that the GASB achieved those objectives it does simplify the accounting. The changes to the actual accounting are listed on this slide, but I'll highlight them quickly here. So the statement requires the interest costs incurred before the end of a construction period be recognized as an expense in the period in which the cost is incurred for financial statements that are prepared using the economic resources measurement focus. As a result, that interest cost incurred before the end of a construction period would not be included in the historical cost of that capital asset that's reported in a business type activity or an enterprise fund. For financial statements that are prepared using the current financial resources measurement focus, interest costs is incurred before the end of that construction period would then be recognized as an expenditure on a basis consistent with governmental fund accounting principles. I hand it over to Amanda to go through statement 82. Thank you, Ashley. So we will go through statement 92 next. This is a very small statement, omnibus 2020. It came out in January of 2020. Uh, very short uh, standard. I think it's only five or six pages, so definitely worth reading through. Clarified uh, various issues and a few other standards, so we'll just um, touch on those. Uh, the first is really that it clarified the effective date 
related to GASB 87 and the implementation guide, which, Je which Ashley just uh, took us through. The main issue that was really clarified within the statement related specifically to interim reporting. So if you had interim reporting, uh, the way that it was previously written would have been applicable uh, sooner than, uh, than the, the implementation of GASB 87. So that was clarified within the statement. The next item was related to reporting of transfers of assets between an employer or contributing entity and a defined benefit pension plan or OPEB plan within the same reporting entity. So there was definitely some differences in how this was reported for entities. And specifically, it clarified that those transfers of assets should be reported as contributions in both the, the contributing entity and the pension plan. So I have seen within uh, financial statements that I have reviewed and clients that I have worked with where those had previously been reported as transfers. So when you look at your government-wide statements, you might be seeing transfers that do not net to zero because it was relating to a transfer to a, a pension or OPA plan that's included within the fiduciary activities of the financial statements. So this really clarified for consistency that that should actually be reported as a contribution in both the reporting entity and the plan. The next uh, item that was clarified related to the reporting of assets accumulated for defined benefit OPEB plans not administered through a trust. So statement, uh, GASB Statement 84 requires the reporting of assets that are accumulated for purposes of providing pensions or OPEB through a defined benefit pension plan or defined benefit OPEB plan that are not administered through trusts that meet the criteria related um, to GASB Statements 73 and 74 required reporting by the government. When GASB 84 came out, it introduced this word of control, which then limited some of the applicability of some of the requirements in those previous standards that it was not meant to do, so it may have scoped some of those plans out of being reported and that it was not meant to do that. So, it, it, so this standard clarified uh, what that uh, actually was intending to do. So the next item was, was related to the applicability of certain requirements of statement uh, number 84, fiduciary activities, to post-employment benefit arrangements. There are actually a couple pieces related to this one, so we'll walk through the, the two pieces that it clarified related to uh, statement number 84. The first piece clarified that pension and OPEB defined benefit plans should apply statement 84 paragraph 21 with, regard, with regards to reporting a liability in the fiduciary fund rather than statement 73 and 74. The previous guidance in 73 and 74 required that a liability to participating employers be reported for an amount of assets accumulated in excess of liabilities for benefits due to plan numbers. So essentially what was happening is that you would end up with no ending uh, net, pos uh, net position for those. So under GASB 84, it clarified that a liability to beneficiaries of a fiduciary activity is only required when an event has occurred that compels the, go the government to disperse fiduciary resources. Events that would compel a government to disperse fiduciary resources occur when a d demand for resources have been made or when no further action, approval, or condition is required to be taken or met by the beneficiary to release the assets. So other liabilities uh, other than those to beneficiaries should be just recognized in accordance with the existing accounting standards using economic resources measurement focus. The second piece of this uh, clarifying item was related to the defined contribution benefit pension or OPEP plans when they're reported as a fiduciary activity that it should file the it should apply the financial statement presentation requirements in paragraphs 20, 21, 23, and 24 of statement 84. So until now, there wasn't actually guidance on how to report these types of plans within the fiduciary statements. So this clarified the accounting that you would follow if you did, in fact, have to pull in a defined contribution plan into your financial statements. 
So the next item was related to the measurement of liabilities and assets of applicable related to an asset retirement obligations in a government acquisition. So in a case where a government has an acquisition, um, typically you would report those uh, assets at acquisition value. This standard clarified that related to specifically asset retirement obligations, you would still follow GASB 83 in determining how that should be reported rather than using acquisition value. So this was, is one exception to using acquisition value. The next item is reporting by public entity risk pools for amounts that are recoverable from reinsurers or excess reinsurers. So previously, GASB 10, which was the, the guidance on this, said to report as a reduction to expenses. GASB 92 clarified that this can be reported as a reduction in expenses, but it is not required to be. So if that is how you were previously reporting them, you can still continue to do that. However, this gives uh, governments a little bit more flexibility on where to report those uh, recoverable items. The last two super, super minor changes, uh, this last one, a reference to non-recurring fair value measurements of assets or liabilities in authoritative literature. It literally just changed the reference paragraph from 453 to 455 uh, related to mortgage loans, so super minor. And this last one is related to terminology referring to derivative instruments. So anywhere where derivatives or a derivative is uh, referenced with any of the guidance, uh, has been updated to be called derivative instrument or derivative instruments. So a terminology change there. So worth the read, very short, um, but definitely has some clarifying items in there that um, are important to apply this year. And with that, I will turn it back to Ashley. Okay, thanks, Amanda. So I'm going to go through statement 90 which is the replacement of interbank offered rates. It was issued back in March of 2020. So many governments have entered into agreements, particularly those derivative instruments and lease agreements, where those variable payments made or received depend on an interbank offered rate or an IBOR. Most notably, the London interbank offered rate or LIBOR. So as a result of global reference rate reform, LIBOR was expected to cease to exist in its current form at the end of 2021. Obviously, it's still um, being published. It's expected to cease publication after June 30, 2023. And all of that is prompting governments to amend or replace those financial instruments for the purpose of replacing LIBOR with other reference rates by either changing the reference rate or adding or changing fallback provisions related to the reference rate. Statement 53 requires a government that renegotiates or amends a critical term of a hedging derivative instrument, things like a reference rate of a hedging derivative instrument's variable payment. They require that you terminate hedge accounting. So Statement 93 provides an exception to that rule, allowing that hedge accounting to continue when an IBOR is replaced as the reference rate of the hedging derivative instrument. There's a lot going on on this slide, and I'm not going to cover it all in specific detail because you'll have access to these slides after the presentation today. But Statement 93 does provide that exception to the termination provision to allow hedge accounting to continue when the reference rate of the original hedging derivative instruments variable payment is an IBOR if all of the criteria that are listed on this slide are met. So I, like I said, I'm not going to go through each individual item because they're pretty detailed. They get a little uh, techy um, in their description, but they're listed in paragraph four of the standard and highly recommend that you just reference that if this is something that applies to your entity or your government. It's also important to note that term changes. So any any time that you change a term um, that may be necessary for the replacement of that reference rate, uh, those term changes are limited to either the frequency the rate of the variable payment resets, the dates on which the rate resets, the methodology for resetting the rate, and then the dates which the periodic payments are made. So a government may choose to transition from an IBOR to an interim reference rate before it transitions to 
a secured overnight financing rate or a SOFR when liquidity in a SOFR market grows. Hedge accounting should continue to be applied in the two-step transition if the criteria that are listed on this slide are met, and that includes the first step replaces an IBOR with another rate, and then that interim rate is replaced by a SOFR in the second step, and then all four of the criteria for a one-step transition are met as discussed in more detail in the standard. And if we had more time, we'd go through this in more detail. Um, you know, there are, there are a handful of clients that I work with that have variable payments that are based on a, an IBOR, so thought it would be important to mention here today. And again, the, the standard's pretty short, so if it does apply to you, I highly encourage you to go to the standard and read it, as it's um, pretty detailed and provides various items to walk through in order to successfully transition to a different rate and how to account for it. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Amanda. Okay, we're gonna next go through GASB statement number 97, certain component unit criteria and accounting and financial reporting for IRS code section 457 deferred compensation plans. So we're gonna cover this statement in, in two parts. And for those of you that are feeling that this statement might be a little bit familiar, when you were implementing GASB 84 last year, there were a couple paragraphs of GASB Statement 97 that were applicable when determining if you had a component unit fiduciary activities to pull into your financial statements. So some of this may, may feel a little familiar already. So the three primary objectives of the statement are to mitigate costs associated with reporting of certain defined contribution pension plans, defined contribution other post-employment benefit plans, so OPEB plans, and employee benefit plans other than pensions or OPEB plans as fiduciary component units in fiduciary fund financial statements. And two, increase consistency and comparability related to the reporting of fiduciary component units in circumstances in which the potential component unit does not have a governing board and the primary government performs the duties that the governing board typically would perform. And then lastly, the third piece was to enhance the relevance, consistency, and comparability of the accounting and financial reporting for the Internal Revenue Code IRC Section 457 Deferred Compensation Plans that meet the definition of a pension plan and for benefits provided through those plans. So as a result of implementing GASB 87, a government may end up removing fiduciary activities that would have previously been re required under GASB 84, and then potentially additional fiduciary activities related to the 457 plans. So specifically, how will this statement actually reduce costs, which was one of the primary objectives of this statement? So the new guidance is really meant to have less defined contribution plans meet the criteria to be deemed a fiduciary activity. For instance, I have a few small government clients that have defined contribution plans. Um, they're currently reported as an enterprise fund that would now have to pull in a defined contribution uh, plan as a fiduciary activity. So there's more for the auditor to audit, some more costs associated with that. And if the plan was already actually being audited, there may still be even more to do there when it gets pulled into a government uh, financial statement because under the, if it was an ERISA plan, potentially it could have had some limited scope over its investments that may have not been previously audited. So when you pull that in, even if you're already having the audit cost for that plan, you still have, will have to then potentially audit these investments that wouldn't have been audited otherwise. So definitely some additional cost to an entity that would have to pull in a defined uh, contribution plan into their financial statements. What specifically changed was that if a defined contribution plan does not have a governing board, it is no longer treated as the governing board of the government being appointed as default. So please note, at least with respect to this, this is only applicable to defined contribution plans. This guidance does not apply to defined benefit plans. That, that guidance should still follow um, GASB 84. Another criteria noted in GASB 84 that would bring in a defined contribution plan uh, previously as a fiduciary activity if there was a legal obligation to contribute say through plan document or state and local law or even historical payments to the plan, 
However, this is also specifically scoped out for defined contribution plans. So there were definitely a couple um, areas that uh, were removed specifically related to defined contribution plans that would scope them out of being pulled in as a fiduciary activity into a uh, primary government's financial statements. So let's go through uh, an implementation example. So we're looking at um, a, a defined contribution plan that currently does not have a governing board. So there's no, there's no governing board related to this plan. The sponsoring government has historically made contributions to the plan each year. And the assets that are held for the benefit of the individual employee participants and their beneficiaries. So, in this example, do you feel, and we're going to have a polling question, so hopefully, hopefully you were all awake for that one. Um, so, in this, this facts and circumstances scenario, is the defined contribution plan a fiduciary activity of the sponsoring government? And Amy is going to take us through this polling question. Yes, so is the uh, plan in the previous example a fiduciary activity of the sponsoring government? Uh, a, yes, it qualifies as a fiduciary activity of the sponsoring government. Uh, B, no, it doesn't qualify. Or C, it depends. It's probably not a fiduciary component unit, but could still be considered a fiduciary activity of the sponsoring government. More information is needed. And while you're answering that, we do see quite a few questions being submitted through the Q&A window. Uh, so thank you for that. But we do have quite a bit of content to cover today. So if we don't have time to respond during the webcast, uh, we will do our best to follow up with you afterwards. All right, it looks like most have responded. So I'm going to pull up the results here. So it looks like 73% of you uh, said it depends, which within accounting guidance, it kind of always depends, right? So uh, I, would, I would agree. But we'll, let's walk through uh, the, the conclusion for this one. So totally agree, it depends. However, there is some definitive information in there. The first part is that in this scenario, uh, we're not looking at a component unit and, and more information is needed really in order to determine if you need to pull it in as a fiduciary activity, but not a component unit. So it's not a component unit because the sponsoring government is not assumed to be financially accountable for the defined contribution plan that lacks a governing board under GASB 97. The second piece is although the sponsoring government is making contributions, it's not deemed to have a financial burden under the exception provided under GASB 97 for defined contribution plans. <clears throat> the piece where we need more information is really related to the assets. So we need to have more information relating to who has control of the assets, are they own source revenues, and who are the beneficiary of those assets. So a little bit more information before we're going to end up pulling this potential um, contribution plan into the primary government financial statement. <clears throat> so now we're going to move on to part two. This is the, if, if you uh, have a 457 plan, this is the piece that probably is going to be more applicable this year, given that pieces of the first part were already a little bit applicable last year when you were evaluating whether a defined contribution plan met the criteria of being a component unit. So this um, piece extends the accounting and reporting to those 457 plans that meet the pension plan definitions. So this supersedes GASB statement number 32 that was previously the guidance uh, related to these 457 plans. So if a plan does meet the definition of a pension plan under GASB statement 67 or OPEB 73, they are to be treated as pension plans. And then if that is the case, uh, statement 84 should be applied to determine whether or not that plan should then be reported as a fiduciary activity. 
So definition under that GASB 67 and 73 related to whether or not it is a pension plan is these are arrangements which pensions are determined, assets dedicated for pensions are accumulated and managed, and benefits are paid as they come due. So if this 457 meets that definition, it, the, the guidance of pension plans will apply to this plan. So if the 457 plan in question does not meet the definition of a pension plan, it is considered to be an other employee benefit plan for reporting purposes. And in that case, you still do need to use uh, GASB statement number 84 to determine whether or not that fiduciary reporting is required. So that concludes GASB statement number 97. Um, it's a relatively short statement as well. If you do have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. As Amy mentioned, we will um, try to, if we have some time at the end, we'll respond to some questions. If not, we will do our best to follow up after. The next statement I'm going to take you through is GASB statement number 91 on conduit debt obligations. Now, don't get nervous. This one is not effective for June 30, 2022 year ends. However, we still included it in this session because this one is unique in the timing of when it is required to be effective, and that is for year end. So de December 31st, 2022 uh, financial statements will need to apply this uh, new statement. So we thought it would be important to at least take you through that today as there are some with those um, year ends. Okay, so the primary objective of this statement is to provide guidance that helps to eliminate diversity in practice related to uh, commitments extended by issuers, arrangements associated with conduit debt obligations, and the related note disclosures related to those types of obligations. The statement achieves those objectives by clarifying the existing definition of a conduit debt obligation, establishing that a conduit debt obligation is not a liability of the issuer, establishing standards for accounting and financial reporting of additional commitments and voluntary commitments extended by users and arrangements associated with conduit debt and improving the required note disclosures. So for accounting and financial reporting purposes, a conduit debt uh, is a debt instrument issued in the name of a state or local government the issuer that is for the benefit of a third party uh, primarily liable for the payment of the debt instrument, so a third-party obligor, such as a nonprofit or small government that is not able to uh, issue their own debt. The characteristics of the conduit debt must include having three parties involved. As you can see on the slide here, you have the issuer, a third-party obligor, and then the debt holder or potentially debt trustee. The next characteristic that a conduit debt obligation would have is that the issuer and the third-party obligor are not within the same financial reporting entity. The debt obligation is not a parity bond of the issuer, nor is it cross-catalyzed with other debt of the insurer. Another characteristic is related to the third-party obligor is being ultimately responsible for receiving the proceeds and being primarily obligated for the payment of the amounts associated with the debt obligation. So you can see the illustration on the slide here kind of shows um, how uh, conduit debt um, functions. So you have your state or local government is going to issue the debt with a debt holder. However, those proceeds are going to go to the third party obligor who is then going to make payments to the debt holder and the issuer did this on the benefit of the third party obligor. So kind of a simple illustration of how a conduit debt uh, functions. So with, within um, a conduit debt obligation, there are three different types of commitments that an issuer um, could uh, provide with the obligation. So this first one is called limited commitment. Uh, so in this limited commitment, there is no responsibility by the issuer to um, provide payments on the obligation. So they're essentially saying, the third party obligor is 100% responsible for payments, we will not help you. However, an issuer could um, provide what is called an additional commitment. So in this type of commitment, the issuer agrees to support debt service payments only in the event that the third party obligor is or will be unable to do so. And then the last type of uh, commitment is a voluntary commitment. This is not considered an additional commitment so this is uh, more on an ad hoc basis. 
So an, an issuer may just decide to make debt service payments um, if they've talked to the third party obligor and their needs and they've requested some assistance, but this is more of a voluntary commitment. Have, you really didn't make it up front, but you have voluntary, voluntarily made a payment um, on that uh, obligation. So the first bullet point here is, is important. So the issuer should not recognize a liability for the conduit debt obligations. That will report it, be reported on the third party obligor's uh, financial statements. However, uh, there are times when a potential related liability could be reported in the issuer's statements as a result of an additional or voluntary commitment here. So, when an additional commitment is made, the issuer agrees to support debt service payments only in the event that the third party obligor is or will be unable to do so. A liability would only be reported in the issuer's financial statements when qualitative factors indicate it is more likely than not that the issuer will support debt service payments. So I'm not going to go through all the qualitative factors, but if you look in uh, Statement 91, Paragraph 13, there is an extensive list of the qualitative factors that you might look at in evaluating whether or not you're going to need to make payment on these obligations. So if you've evaluated um, your additional commitments and voluntary commitments and determined that a liability is necessary um, to be reported, this could be reported within your funds as well as your government-wide statements. Uh, so if, it, if something does need to be reported, uh, you would record these similar to, to other types of liabilities. So within your uh, governmental fund statements, you're going to report on your current financial resources measurement. So you're really only going to record a liability related to what you have in available resources. However, then when you report any sort of full accrual, so your government-wide statements or your proprietary fund statements, uh, those would be required to be reported under the economic resources measurement focus. So you're going to need to evaluate the obligation and future cash flows, and those liabilities would be recorded at the present value of future cash flows. Another note to make here is that, that you will need to evaluate these uh, liabilities annually, these commitments annually. The only thing that doesn't need evaluation uh, annually is that limited commitment. So if you've provided no commitment to the third party obligor, you don't need to make these evaluations annually. However, if you have some sort of commitment, uh, you will need to uh, evaluate these annually. So uh, an additional item with conduit debt is that there could be arrangements included in here. We touched on this a little bit um, under GASB Statement 87, as these do um, look and sound like potential uh, lease, uh, uh, leases. And so there's, I'm not going to go through each of these on the slide. I'm going to actually go through the accounting so we can touch on them then. Uh, but there are essentially four scenarios where um, the, the recording of these arrangements included within your debt conduit debt obligations might require some accounting by the issuer. So this is the di different types of accounting for these types of arrangements. So if there is an arrangement within the conduit debt obligation where the issuer completely relinquishes title related to capital assets that may have been built with the proceeds uh, from this obligation, the issuer still has no liability to report, no capital assets to report, and no receivable payments to, to report. The next one is an issuer retains the title of the capital asset that was, that was built with these proceeds. However, the obligor has the use of the entire asset. So the accounting for the, the issuer would be no liability for conduit debt, no receivable for payments, no capital asset on the books. However, at the end of the arrangement, the issuer will recognize a capital ac asset at acquisition value and an inflow of resources, so revenue, in that same amount. The last one is the issuer retains title of the asset and the obligor has use of portions of the asset. So it's still no liability related to the conduit debt or receivable payments. However, this one is a little bit different that it immediately recognizes the entire capital asset at acquisition value and a deferred inflow of resources or revenue for that same amount that is recognized over the term of the arrangement. 
So some expanded disclosures related to the conduit debt, so definitely clarified these um, in more detail on what needs to be recorded, so description of the conduit debt and what type of commitment you have, if any. And then the last thing that's really important is, uh, is disclosing the aggregate outstanding principle on all debt obligations that share the same type of commitments at the end of the year. So for implementation, just a couple tips here is um, I would work on inventorying all of your conduit debt over the next um, six months to a year and uh, evaluating whether or not you have any commitments or associated asset arrangements of those. If you do currently report that debt on your financial statements, that will likely require adjustment. And then moving forward, um, developing some internal controls and processes and procedures and evaluating your commitments annually, adding new conduit debt to your schedules as they occur, and then um, getting an uh, internal control in order to obtain those year imbalances of the conduit debt for your disclosures. So I'm going to skim through these because we need to get to a polling question, but I want to touch on these two just really quickly because, hint, hint, they're going to be in your polling question. But we have um, a few standards looking ahead, so more to come on these over the next year or so. Um, statement number 94 on public-private and public-public partnerships and the availability of payment arrangements and how those will be reported in financial statements. And then Ashley walked us a little bit through statement number 96, subscription-based information technology and arrangements. You also have statement 99 to look forward to, so another clarifying statement on a number of changes uh, related to various uh, standards. Uh, updated statement on how to account for changes and error corrections. And then lastly, the most recent Gatsby issued was statement number 101 on compensated absences. And with that, I will have Amy take you through our last polling question. All right, thank you. So last question is, looking ahead, what statement will most significantly impact your organization? A, Gatsby Statement 94, B, Gatsby Statement 96, or C, neither apply to our organization? And while you're answering that, for those that would like a copy of today's slides, you can download them from the folder that says Slide Deck and Handouts. And then we'll also be sending them via email tomorrow along with a recording of the webcast. I'll leave this up another few seconds so we can close this one out. We're getting close to the end here. All right, here you go. Okay, so it looks like um, not not super surprising. I was I was expecting that there was going to be quite a few GASB 96 implementation out there over the next couple years. So definitely more to come. I know um, based on Ashley's poll that a number of you will plan on implementing that in, with in conjunction with GASB Statement 87. Uh, and then the, it sounds like there's a few lucky ones out there that neither of these apply to your organization. So um, you, can, you can skip over those. Although it's always important to know what GASBs are out there in case you do enter into a new arrangement um, that might require some new accounting. And as Amy mentioned, we have a number of questions in the Q&A. Um, these were, will be items that we will um, work on following up over the next couple days and get you some answers to your questions. And just so you have a little bit more information, uh, if you go to Moss Adams' website, there's some more insights and resources on a number of the standards we actually talked about today, specifically GASB 87, um, some COVID-19 resources, uh, some other upcoming events related to governments. Um, some more uh, some more specific content there, and um, you can always subscribe to getting more Moss Adams content. All right, thank you. So um, we are at time, so I'm going to close this out here real quick. Uh, thank you, Ashley and Amanda, for a great presentation today. 
And to our audience, if you met all CPE requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. And then a copy will be emailed within three weeks should you have difficulty downloading, downloading it now. And then finally, here is a link to an online survey for today's presentation. And thank you for joining our webcast. We hope you'll join us again next time. Take care, everyone.